So this is a video on neoplasms, that's cancer. Uh, we're gonna look at some of the general principles of, of cancer, uh, very little bit of treatment, the diagnosis and the treatment. Uh, we're not gonna be looking at specific cancers in this uh, video. Okay, so all cancer cells start out as normal cells and normal cells have a uh, plasma membrane. They have a nucleus with this, with the um, genetic material, the nucleolus. They have all of the or organelles that are there and things are normal. We talk about cells becoming differentiated. They, they, um, they uh, become the type of cell that, that is necessary in that tissue. And initially we all start out as one cell and then two and four and eight and 16 and 32, et cetera. And at some point along the way, the cells start to differentiate. They start to become epithelial tissue. They become uh, connective tissue. They become neural tissue or muscular tissue. Uh, and then they further dif uh, differentiate and the epithelial tissue will become epidermis or whatever it, it's supposed to be. And, uh, but all of these, these cells carry with them in their nucleus, the DNA, the, the genetic code, the same as every other cell. It's just differentiation really is talking about um, which genes get expressed in that particular cell at that particular time. And by the principle of complementarity, the structure reflects the function, and the function is reflected in the structure. So uh, this is kind of the whole point of differentiation. Now, the cell goes through a life cycle. They reproduce by mitosis. We won't get into meiosis right now. But the, in the cell life cycle, the mitotic phase the, uh, happens. And then the cell goes through a growth phase after mitosis, the two daughter cells become, they start to grow and we call that G1. And there's a checkpoint that happens at G1 that, that decides whether the cell is in fact viable. Is the cell doing what it's supposed to do? Is the cell too old? Are there, uh, uh, the telomeres uh, at the ends of the DNA gone, et cetera, et cetera. <coughs> There's basically a checklist. And what happens there is that if it passes the checklist, the, the cell goes on, undergoes the S phase where the DNA is replicated, the G2 phase, and ultimately enters mitosis again. This takes some time and we have this checkpoint. If it fails at the checkpoint, then the cell goes into apoptosis, which is cellular death. It's programmed cellular death. It uh, means that the cell is no longer viable or, for, or it's superfluous for whatever reason. And it doesn't undergo mitosis. It, it in fact, dies. Now, a lot of times the DNA when it's replicated in the S phase, can get mistakes introduced in that DNA. And we call these mistakes mutations. Now, the only mutations that matter to subsequent generations is mutations within the DNA in the gametes, in the sperm and the eggs. And if those mutations happen in that DNA, then the next generation can get that mistake. And what's, what's particularly bad about that is the mistake in one cell then 
becomes a mistake in every cell in that new organism. But this stuff happens all the time in individual cells within the within the body, in the somatic cells of the body, not the sexual cells of, of the body. But the thing about that is that it only affects the offspring of those particular cells. So if there is a mistake made and some abnormal proteins are being made because of that mistake, and that mistake could be caused by a number of factors that we'll get into, but uh, that mistake will show up in all the subsequent generations of that cell within that tissue. Now, uh, normally, if the mutation is bad enough or if it's abnormal enough, the immune system takes care of that and directs that cell to apoptosis. Uh, but sometimes that kind of slips under the radar and that mutation carries on. Um, and that can lead to problems with the differentiation. It can lead to problems with the cell life cycle <clears throat> and mitosis. It can lead to problems of the function of that tissue if enough cells from that original, from that problem, from that mistake, survive and are malfunctioning. So this is really the basis of cancer. Um, there's a very good theory that, that shows a lot of promise in research, is that when tissues get damaged by whatever chemicals or radiation or whatever, that the damage repair requires um, cells to step up and, and, and fix the damage. That requires maybe rushing mitosis so that the cells reproduce faster. It might uh, result in some sort of uh, metaplasia, so the changing of the cell function. Um, to, to manage the stresses placed on it. There is a theory that a lot of tumors happen because of this rushing and because of this really differentiated cells trying to revert back to almost stem cells so that they can replace the damaged tissue and mistakes are made at that point. Uh, it's... It's a working theory. It's by no means a proven thing, but it's it's worthy of consideration. Um, and what this theory goes on to propose is that that these things, when they work, the tissue is repaired and things are good. When it doesn't work properly, 99% of the time, the immune system, the cellular immunity takes care of it, and those cells that aren't doing what they're supposed to do end up in apoptosis, and, and it's all good. And a very small percentage of them kind of escape that scrutiny, and they don't undergo apoptosis and lead to uh, oncogenesis, so to, to neoplasm. Uh, it's it's probably elements of the theory are are probably very sound. So we, oncology is the study of cancer, and this is is the pathophysiology of it, the diagnosis of it, the prevention of it, the treatment of it, uh, all kind of fall under this. Uh, umbrella term oncology and the people that specialize it in our, our oncologists. So another name for tumor is a neoplasm. And really this is the 
unregulated cellular growth. It's almost like a hyperplasia, metasplasia, dysplasia combination. And and the cell doesn't respond to normal genetic controls anymore. And, and, and they're reproducing when there's no need for more cells for, for, for that reproduction to be happening. And the reproduction is often really rushed. The cell life cycle shortens quite a bit and they spend a lot of time in mitosis before the organelles in the cytoplasm have time to grow and multiply and so and and things get organelles get shared unevenly in these mitotic events and and the cells become more and more abnormal and and more undifferentiated um The cells are, tend to reproduce so quickly that they don't have time to grow and mature. So often in a tumor, the cells that you see are really immature and, and atypical because, because if the division happens and organelles don't get shared because uh, there's not enough of them, then there will be organelles missing and things like that. Um, you can imagine with this rate of growth, like it's unremittent cellular growth, that it's going to use up a lot of resources, a lot of proteins, a lot of the amino acids, a lot of cellular energy, a lot of oxygen and blood supply and nutrients get used by this rapidly growing mass of undifferentiated cells the tumor. And then that's actually going to deprive those resources, to deprive the healthy, normal cells surrounding of those resources, deprive it of nutrients and oxygen, uh, and really even space to grow. Um, it might be within the same tissue, it might be in adjacent tissues. Um, right? And a lot of times, the, these tumor cells, they still retain enough differentiation that they're kind of related to at least the, uh, the broad category of tissue that they belong to. So tumors of epithelial origin tend to have epithelial characteristics, and tum tumors of Connective tissue origin tend to have connective tissue characteristics. Screwed up, mind you, but nevertheless, that kind of those kind of characteristics, those kind of growth patterns, those kind of structures, those those kinds of things. But it may not be the appropriate epithelium or the appropriate connective tissue cell or or muscle cell or whatever. Uh, and so it really, the characteristics of every tumor really depend on where they come from. So we describe tumors as omas. Benign tumors just have the, the suffix oma. And before the suffix oma, we use the term, the root term that describes the tissue. So a gland is adeno. So an adenoma is, the, is a benign tumor of glandular tissue. Um, if the, uh, if the, the tumor is malignant, then that's cancer. Um, and it has the suffix carcinoma. Uh, so a malignant tumor of uh, the epithelial cells that are in a gland would be an adenocarcinoma. Okay. We tend to use the word carcinoma, not exclusively, but most of the time when you hear the word the 
suffix carcinoma, it refers to a tumor of epithelial origin. If the tumor is uh, of connective tissue or muscular tissue, it, and it's malignant, it's usually sarcoma, sarcoflesh, uh, so flesh tumors. So, uh, so a sarcoma of bone would be an osteosarcoma. That's the malignant tumor that Terry Fox had and ultimately killed him was, uh, was an osteosarcoma. Um, we, we have chondrosarcomas that start in cartilage, et cetera. Um, a lot of times, like half a century ago, most diseases were named for the person that described them. Um, or they were named by the person that first described them. And they didn't have to follow any of the nomenclature rules. And so some of the old names have persisted. Uh, we're slowly trying to get rid of a lot of them. And it's not just in oncology, but in all pathology. So, but some of the, these names are so well known that they, they just persist. Um, so, uh, like examples would be like Cushing syndrome. They're trying to now call it diabetes type three or, you know, things like that. Um, von Recklinghausen's uh, neurofibromatoma, uh, thing, things like uh, things like that. So there's a, a few cancers that just have stuck with the old names. And the, the ones that stuck with the old names, oh my goodness, uh, an example would be leukemia, Wilms tumor in kids, uh, Hodgkin's, you know, Hodgkin's lymphomas and, and things like that. Um, and therefore non-Hodgkin's lymphomas. Uh, really have persisted, but it's fairly rare that we follow that nomenclature now. And we're slowly trying to move away from it as, as much as we can. Okay, so we start out with the root is the type of tissue. So lip is fat. As in, as in liposuction. So a lipoma is a benign tumor of fatty tissue. Uh, you know, uh, a malignant would be a sarcoma. So a fibrosarcoma is a malignant tumor of fibrous connective tissue proper. Okay. So I've been saying that the nomenclature is about uh, benign tumors versus malignant tumors is, is reflected in the nomenclature, but what is a benign tumor and what is a malignant tumor? You, you would think that for such common things, it's, the, the definitions are fairly general and loose. Uh, loosely applied. Benign tumors can become malignant, and, and so there's a little bit of gray area in between. But fundamentally, a benign tumor is cells that have lost their uh, ability to follow their normal life cycle, but they've stayed more or less differentiated. They, they they're just reproducing way too quickly, and the inhibition to reproduction is uh, is lost. They so they are very quickly undergoing basically hyperplasia, uh, and just reproducing and reproducing and reproducing. 
inappropriately, and that's the thing. They tend to be encapsulated. So a benign tumor really has a capsule around it. Uh, there is the tumor, a capsule, and then non-tumor cells. And there's no, there's a definitive line between the two. Uh, one of the reasons why benign tumors are easily removed, because you just take the tumor and the capsule, you can surgically excise it and leave the normal tissue. As opposed to malignant tumors, which are infiltrating into the surrounding tissue, and there is no clear line between the tumor and the healthy tissue. Benign tumors encapsulated, there is a line. Right? The damage that benign tumors cause uh, really revolve around the space they take up. Uh, and it's funny, I, I always kind of chuckle to myself, probably because one of my early professors said this and, uh, and, and it stuck with me. I don't know why they do it, but benign tumors usually get compared to a fruit. It's like, oh, she had a tumor the size of a grapefruit. Uh, oh, she has just just a small little tumor the size of a of a mandarin. Uh, oh God, that tumor is the size of a pear. Uh, like that, and it seems sporting goods seem to come into. Oh, she had a, the tumor in her over the size of a softball. Oh, my God, that uh, that tumor is in her abdomen. It's the size of a volleyball. Um, I think it's just for comparison. And then the reason that we tend to do this with benign tumors is because the size and the compression of adjacent tissues and the causing of ischemia by blocking blood vessels and the resources they use up uh, affects the other tissue and affects the health of the person rather than toxic effects of the tumor itself. It's the presence of the tumor. Usually they're not life-threatening. Sometimes they are. It depends on where they are and how much space they're taking up. Uh, brain tumors tend to be, uh, benign brain tumors, tend to be more life-threatening than other things because literally there's no extra space in your skull. And a tumor of the brain is going to compress neural tissue someplace and and then cause problems. Malignant tumors are really undifferentiated. The, the cells become completely non-functional or malfunctional. Uh, and they lose their differentiation. They still are undergoing very rapid uh, reproduction. The mitosis happens a lot. So if you look at a slide of a tumor, a large percentage of the cells are going to be in mitosis and not necessarily in the interface. And this informs some of the common treatments. We'll talk about that later. But remember that the malignant, well, both benign and malignant tumors reproduce at a higher rate than normal, and therefore more cells will be in mitosis. One of the things about the malignant tumors is that they infiltrate into the surrounding tissue. They, they start to take over, they, they, especially after they develop uh, a blood supply. We're going to talk about that in a few minutes. But they, they spread. Carcinoma literally means crab, and that's because it's these tumors look like crabs with the legs and the claws going into the other tissues. Malignant tumors often lose cell to cell adhesions, and cells break off of these malignant cells break off, and they can spread to distant sites via the lymphatics or blood or uh, and so. The, a tumor might pop up like a 
a tumor that started out in the prostate might pop up in uh, in the lumbar spine, in the bones of the lumbar spine. It's a common place for that. Lung cancer often ends up metastasizing to bone. And we call this spread to distant sites metastasis. So to compare them, the cells are similar. They, they're still differentiated in benign tumors. Uh, they, they're undergoing mitosis. It's too quick, but it is reasonably normal. So because of that, the growth of the tumor is fairly slow. Uh, it expands. It takes up space. Uh, usually have an encapsulation. And the tumor, because of the encapsulation, stays put. Like it becomes, it stays a single tumor. Um, it only has systemic effects if it's in certain places, like the brain, or or like maybe in in the bronchi of the lungs or something, and impairing breathing, that kind of thing. Malignant tumors are all uh, all over the place, so it's really dysplasia. Um, they vary in size and shape. They tend to have very large nuclei because they're undergoing mitosis so fast. They're undifferentiated. A lot of the cells. Mitosis is increased, but it's also atypical. It's happening so fast that the mistakes are being made all the time. The growth is very rapid. The cells don't stick to each other, and so they invade the local tissue. They, they're not encapsulated. They can spread locally or can be seeded to other places, metastasized by a lymph and blood vessels. Uh, usually, if it's malignant, it's going to present with systemic symptoms. And almost by definition, they are life-threatening. So here's kind of a stylized picture of of the two types, so benign with the capsule, relatively normal cells just becoming a mass. Uh, and the malignant tumor is invading in the local tissue. Uh, once they invade through a blood vessel, they can metastasize. The cells are all over the place. There's pockets of necrosis, especially if it's outgrowing its blood supply, um, that kind of thing. These cells for in malignant tumors really are missing their checkpoint. They don't go to apoptosis. They, they, that's not, these cells should be dying. They should be self-removing, right? There's no organization. Differentiation falls apart. Contact inhibition, to remind you from, uh, from, physiology is one of the things that inhibits mitosis is the presence of other cells. If, if a cell is completely surrounded and is being touched by other cells in the tissue, then there's no need for that cell to reproduce anytime soon. It will, but it but it's regulated, slowed down by the contact of other cells. If there was tissue damage, like a cut or something like that, then there's no contact to that healthy cell. And so that cell will be programmed to undergo mitosis. So we call this process contact inhibition. And malignant tumors lose contact inhibition. They grow e even though they are being contacted. The cell membranes screw up. There, there'll be the wrong proteins in it. There'll be blebs and, and problems with that. The surface antigens will be screwed up because things are happening so fast that the, the normal um, antigens that are on the cell, the, the, uh, the self-identifying for antigens aren't correct. Um, 
they lose, not only do they lose contact inhibition, but they lose their tight junctions and their desmosomes and things like that. And, and the cells really are free to break apart uh, and break loose from the mass and, and spread and get seeded to different sites. They also will have mass and and compromise blood vessels and lead to ischemia uh, and the death of malignant cells and healthy cells. But it's a necrotic death, which then causes inflammation. And inflammation is often a hallmark around the tumor and, and the inflammatory chemicals and, and the diapedesis and all of that stuff is happening, which then actually enhances the ability for um, uh, the, the tumor to metastasize. Um, oftentimes, the tumor because the tumor's lost sight of what it's supposed to do. So it, it secretes abnormal products, abnormal proteins that are enzymes or surface proteins or hormones, right? Um, and oftentimes these things will, especially if they're hormones that control things like calcium and sodium, uh, that will get screwed up systemically because normally these hormones regulate those ions very closely. And once that hormone level is disturbed by another source of the hormone, call this perineoplastic, I'll get to it in a second, but it's, uh, it, it will create systemic effects. A huge important thing in uh, the development of a tumor, a malignant tumor especially, is something called angiogenesis. And the tumor will grow very, very quickly. And the cells within the tumor will start to become ischemic because they have they're far away from the blood vessels. The tumor grows faster than the blood vessels do. But a lot of malignant tumors actually secrete, the cells secrete growth factors. Growth factors are normal things that maintain blood supply to forming tissue. But this thing gets out of control. And so what happens is it causes angiogenesis, the growth of new blood vessels and blood supply to the tumor. Uh, and when that happens, the tumor starts to really rob the body of nutrients and, and oxygen and things because it's created its own blood supply. Uh, and it's these growth factors that do it. And that's usually that's often a turning point in the development of the tumor. Once the, this angiogenesis happens, now the tumor becomes self-sustaining and becomes more serious. A lot of treatment, especially early treatment, is about how to prevent these growth factors and how to prevent angiogenesis so that this, the tumor will stay local. A lot of these chemicals that are released cause inflammation and any, any necrosis causes inflammation. And the inflammation will often affect the normal cells and the organ that the, that the tissue is in will lose its integrity and stop functioning. We need all our organs to function properly and so therefore... It's it it can be a real problem systemically. Like the whole organism will be affected by the loss of function in an organ, and oftentimes that revolves around inflammation and and ischemia. 
Okay, here's some warning signs. Uh, I've seen these variations on this slide all over the place. I find it somewhat general. Uh, I find it not inclusive enough or sometimes too inclusive, but usually it's got something to do with with unusual bleeding or discharges. If we're seeing that, we get worried. So um, like if there is blood in your stool, uh, my father had colorectal cancer and his warning sign was blood in the stool. He asked me about it. I'm, I said, you got to get that checked, Ed. And, and sure enough, he had bowel cancer. Um, Change in bowel or bladder habits, uh, so it could be diarrhea or it could be constipation. Skin cancer, a change in the color or the size or the shape of a wart or mole. Uh, sores that don't heal often are in indicative of cancer. Uh, unexplained weight loss, anemia, persistent fatigue. Um, my my friend Jim, uh, what brought him to the doctor to get diagnosed with leukemia, which eventually killed him, was anemia and persistent fatigue and bruising. Um, so persistent cough or hoarseness without reason. Palpable lumps, uh, especially in the breast or the testes, but other places on the body. Probably would be a benign, but could be malignant tumor, if it's changing quickly, especially. Um, but if you look at these things, these are warning signs in cancer, but they're also the symptoms of other things, like diarrhea, uh, anemia, persistent cough, uh, weight loss or weight gain. Like, who's to say that that's cancer? And so one of the problems that these warning signs have is that they're, they're also signs of other things. They can be misinterpreted and be signs of other things. And a lot of people that show these signs ignore them because it's like, well, of course I cough. Like, I've been smoking since I was 13 and um, yeah, things like that. Uh, Geez, I got some blood in my stool. I guess my hemorrhoids are acting up. Those sorts of things. And so not heeding warning signs of anything really can lead to delaying the diagnosis. Usually tumors aren't very painful. Uh, they they become painful by the space they take up and uh, and the ischemia that they cause rather than the the um, the tumor emitting noxious pain causing substances inflammation from the tumor can cause pain. But often pain is absent until really late. But sometimes pain is the only thing that shows. Right? I had a patient come to see me, and uh, she thought she had a, a shoulder problem. She had a problem with her clavicle. Uh, and I was palpating, and I could feel a mass kind of behind her clavicle. And so I sent her for x-rays, and it turned out she had lung cancer. She had a big malignant tumor right up in the apex of the lung, right behind the um, the clavicle. And the space that it took up was pushing on the clavicle and, and causing pain. And that's why she came to see me. Who knows when it would have been diagnosed uh, because she had really, she didn't have any abnormal coughing. She coughed and she had, she had managed to, to put away all her other symptoms. She was pretty stressed. There were, there were some things going on in her life uh, financially that uh, she, that's how she explained her weight loss. She thought it was stress. 
things like that. It had ended up uh, killing her uh, because it was stage four when it was found. But nevertheless, it was well advanced before there was even any pain or any other symptoms. Uh, different tumors, different types of cancer will exhibit this at different times. The cancers are the, that are the most deadly are the ones that are asymptomatic or have the least amount of symptoms until late. Things that are really painful or, or, or cause problems early in their development are usually caught early enough that they're more treatable. Because the tumor takes up space, it can compress ducts or passageways or blood supply, lymphatic, the digestive tract. So if you've got a, a, a big tumor in your colon, literally, poop can't pass uh, and you have an obstruction in there, airflow in the bronchi. Tissue necrosis and ulceration leads to bleeding. Uh, and oftentimes that is one of the first signs, like it was for my father. Right. Here's the different types of obstructions by tumors. You can look at the picture. Huge uh, in systemic effects it is weight loss cachexia, which is wasting. Uh, People often are anorexic. Uh, they don't. Feel, they lose their appetite. They're fatigued. There's pain. There's stress, and the tumors are demanding and taking nutrients from the body, which leaves less for the rest of the tissues. Uh, I went to visit a, a buddy of mine in the hospital. He was. Uh, at the end of life, he was on palliative care. Um, and I'd seen him about a month before. And he looked like him. Uh, maybe a little gray. He wasn't feeling well. He had malaise. He had some pain. He had, And he knew he had cancer. He was undergoing treatment. Uh, so the next time I saw him is when I went to see him in the hospital. And oh my God, like he was like 98 pounds. Like he, he had wasted away to nothing. His cheeks were sunken and his, like, uh, it was remarkable how quick he lost this weight. He had anemia. Oftentimes you'll see people that are have malignant tumors. They will have generalized like a gray complexion because of the anemia. Um, nutritional deficits, et cetera. Uh, so the anemia can be caused by blood loss at the site, especially if it's digestive system, or it can be caused by, if the tumor is in the bone marrow, it can it, it can affect the, the bone marrow. And oftentimes metastasis is to bone. Uh, or it's just the hemoglobin doesn't have enough resources to be made. Um, you have fatigue because of all of these things, plus the stress of treatment. Like these things are treated aggressively and that's hard on people. There can be infusions, secondary infections because, uh, because the immune system is robbed of resources. And so people become have problems with this. They often bleed because the tumors erode into the blood vessels in the area. But we can have these things called perineoplastic syndromes. And this is often a very big deal. So every epithelial cell has the capability of doing anything that an epithelial cell can do. So just because the epithelial cell was a type 1 cell in the bronchi or in, in, in the alveoli of the lungs, uh, 
is now a small cell carcinoma. Those cells, as they lose their differentiation, might start to develop and think or, or become glandular cells. So what would happen if the tumor starts behaving like it is an adrenal cortex and starts pumping out cortisol unregulated and unstopping? Uh, what would the effects of the body be, right? What would happen if it, if it starts pumping out aldosterone or antidiuretic hormone or atrial uh, naturetic hormone or uh, calcitonin or parathyroid hormone? Like, picture how much that's going to screw up the homeostasis of the person. Um, oftentimes, the perineoplastic syndrome is is how this thing is found. Uh, it, it it can be really really harmful to people. It can actually kill people. Uh, so, yeah because it's going to screw up neurological function as well as endocrine function. And really, um, cancer affects neurological and endocrine functions first and foremost uh, for, system, for systemic effects. So we want to diagnose routine screening has its problems and uh this is not the forum to for me to debate or to elucidate some of the problems but there's a lot of false positives that cause people a lot of stress but the thinking is we'd rather deal with the false positives than no diagnosis and and having tumors develop further so it's it's for early detection uh common things are things like mammograms uh things like uh psas uh for prostate um they used to do more routine lung uh x-rays and things like that um I'm noticing a trend in, in at least in Ontario, that we are backing away from some of these routine screenings uh, for a lot of reasons, but I think most of it has got to do around money, but that's another thing. Um, directing people for self-examination, uh, especially for breast cancer, testicular cancer, and skin cancer. Uh, those are, are big deals. Uh, so you start noticing that, hey, that mole has gotten a lot bigger. I better get that checked out. Um, every time you're in the shower, you know, feel the girls and think if there's any lump and it says changing, and that kind of thing. Uh, we do a lot of screening tests or blood tests, uh, and we're looking for tumor markers. Usually we use the blood test to, uh, to follow up on the treatment. Um, X-rays, MRIs, CT scans uh, help. Uh, biopsy, if you're ex if you think there's something, so if you feel a lump, the mammogram shows a lump. They want to know what the lump is. They biopsy it and they look at the cell sample and they look at at that kind of thing. Really, biopsy is the most dependable way of differentiating between a benign and a malignant tumor. We look at tumor markers, the antigens and things like that. Uh, we look at genetic mutations. Uh, so the genomic tumor assessment that's fairly rare. Okay, so the malignant tumors, which is obviously what we're talking the most about here, 
we look at the invasion, uh, at, at how the, these malignancies spread. Invasion is local. It's the tumor getting bigger and growing into adjacent, adjacent tissues. So cervical cancer can invade the uterus, invade the vagina. Uterine cancer can spread, and it spreads locally. Metastasis is when it spreads to different sites. It almost skips tissues in between, and, and it usually happens because of lymphatic or vascular blood spread. Um, so we can follow these patterns. So any tumor that originates in the, um, in the digestive system, in the alimentary canal, because of the blood supply of the hepatic portal system, will probably spread to liver as the next site, because that's where the blood goes from the digestive system. And so colon cancer often metastasizes to liver. Prosthetic cancer, because of the, the way the lymph flows, often ends up in bone, etc. Like it, it goes along those sorts of things. Uh, and different cancers have typically different ways of doing it in different places that they go. And it's really got to reflect the blood supply and the lymphatic drainage. So here's local invasion, uh, metastatic invasion. So the primary tumor goes, it goes into the lymph nodes. And that's why one of the things that we do is we uh, oftentimes, like in, in treatment of breast cancer, they, they biopsy the lymph nodes to see if it's spread into the lymph nodes. Uh, if it hasn't, then there's no chance that it's metastasized further. If it has, then we investigate further. It can move just along body fluids, just in the peritoneal cavity and things like that, uh, much slower. It tends to be uh, secondary tumors within the same cavity, though. So we really want to know when, when a tumor is diagnosed, when a cancer is diagnosed, how bad is it and how far does it spread? And there are there's fundamentally two methods that overlap quite a bit. It's called uh, staging, which is this slide, and grading the cancer. I'll start with grades. So there's the grades are one, two, three, and four. So it's one to four. A grade one is differentiated cells. So uh, it's almost like there's no cancer or there is no cancer is grade one. Grade two is, uh, is some metaplasias, some loss of differentiation. Grade three is a lot of loss of differentiation. Grade four is completely undifferentiated. So what they're looking at with the grades is the histology of the cells in the tumor. Uh, and so that's, so we're looking at a grade four. This is a completely undifferentiated, likely malignant tumor. And we do this off the biopsy by literally looking at the sample. Staging the tumor is looked at, uh, looks at, at how much it's spread, right? Uh, the size of the tumor, the spread of the tumor, right? That kind of thing. The most common staging that we use, and really staging is one to four. So, so a, a stage 
well, it's zero to four, but it's, it's so in situ is the earliest stage. So there's a tumor, but it's localized. It's, it is where it's formed. It's in situ. It's staying put. As that tumor grows, it becomes localized. And then, so it's staying within the tissue that it originated from, but it's invading that tissue. Once it spreads into adjacent tissues, we call it regional. So when that cervical cancer ends up in the walls of the vagina and whatever, then it's regional. And then it's distant. It has spread to a distant stage. That's kind of the four levels of it. But we often pull these things together in a system called the TMN system. And you're going to see this when you're in practice. You're going to see this if you end up dealing with any oncology patients. And it's the one that that um, that people, the lay people talk about it. Oh, that's stage four or that's stage whatever. Uh, so TMN stands for tumor, metastasis, and node. So the size of the tumor uh, can be zero to four. Zero is no tumor. Four is, is huge. And everything in between. So really the the and we're also looking at not only the size of the tumor but the differentiation. So kind of the grade like it, it oftentimes the T part of the TMN will be uh will be incorporating grade. M is the spread. M really is a binary thing. It either has spread by metastasis or it hasn't. So it's if it's M0, it's it hasn't metastasized. If it's M1, it has metastasized. N is the involvement of the nodes. N0, no uh, lymph node involvement. M1, the, the adjacent lymph nodes. Uh, and two is a little further, and three is distal lymph nodes. And so we can we come up with these numbers. So if something is a T four N three M one, that's a stage four cancer that's metastasized and is involving a lot of lymph nodes. Uh, and the prognosis is really bad, right? A stage zero is like a T0, M0, N0 is, it's a small little tumor that is localized, not metastasized, uh, and it doesn't involve any lymph nodes. It's an in situ tumor. So, Catching something at stage zero is way easier to treat because it's right there, it's in situ, than a full-on stage four uh, cancer, right? Generally, if it's if it's the maximum on all of these measures, then treatment is palliative, right? So my dad was diagnosed with prostate cancer as a stage zero, uh, maybe a one. It was the, his oncologist said, this is the earliest that I've ever detected prostate cancer. And it made him a candidate for a new experimental treatment that worked. Uh, and it was very easy for him to treat. And he went another 20 years without any problems with the prostate and they didn't have to remove his prostate. So um, go figure, you want, to, you want to be as low as possible on this. Like, and like I say, a zero, stage zero, is just an in situ 
cancer. If there's no cancer at all, then you wouldn't even use any staging, right? Okay, so what causes this? Why, where does it come from? So uh, carcinogenesis is how does we go from a normal cell into a cancer cell? Well, there's a lot of things that are involved. It's multifactorial. The, the best quote I've ever heard about this is that uh, genetics sets, loads the gun and environment pulls the trigger. So there's, there's often a genetic component to it. It's hereditary. Uh, the, you know, things run in families. Bowel cancer runs in families. Different cancers run in families. It could be that you do not make the correct enzymes that help deal with some of the stresses in the environment, et cetera. Environmental effects play a huge part. Uh, sometimes the the cell is stressed by an infection. Uh, in the case of cervical cancer, it's often uh, viral. It's it's the genital warts, right? Some cancers we are very well established risk factors. We know what causes them, and other cancers it's completely a guessing game. These factors, though, these environmental factors, really depend on the susceptibility of the individual to the factors. My uncle, I think I've told you this, my uncle smoked two packs of unfiltered cigarettes a day and worked underground in an asbestos mine. And he died at 92 years of age. He had no lung cancer. He had no lung problems. Uh, which is amazing. Yet other people, you know, they work in a they worked in a bar in the eighties and from secondhand smoke end up with lung cancer. So uh, there's this genetic susceptibility to it. But uh, but carcinogenesis is produced by carcinogens, and often there's a pro carcinogen. It's an irreversible chain to cellular DNA. So we're not talking about DNA that in the gametes and it happens in individual cells. It may not get expressed. It doesn't create neoplasm. So this is an initiating factor. It sets you up. It could be a hereditary. It could be an insult to the DNA, but whatever. It, it, there's, it is kind of priming the pump, as it were. Then there are promoters. So promoters could be environmental chemicals, most often they are, but could be hormonal changes. And the reason that's here is because so much is talked about uh, the progress of breast cancer and estrogen receptors on those cells, but, uh, but it further changes the DNA. And it, speeds up the rate of mitosis. It uh, bypasses the checkpoints that lead to apoptosis. Uh, it circumvents the forces that, that drive differentiation. So we end up with dysplasia and anaplasia. And if we think back to the first or second lecture of this course, when we talked about dysplasia and anaplasia and metaplasia and how those things progress and and the cellular damage that's happening and this is what we were leading to but all of this promoters lead to the development of the tumor so it could be pollutants it could be cigarette smoke it could be ultraviolet light it could be radiation uh, it could be toxins, it could be viral infections, it could be a lot of things that is going to lead to this malignant cell that starts reproducing.
Okay, there are genes that uh, that are in our our DNA, normal genes. They're called oncogenes. They regulate all growth, good growth, bad growth. They regulate growth. Um, sometimes viruses, which are called oncoviruses, alter the the oncogenes. They alter the, the DNA. And they're doing it so that they can take over. It's like if if a virus is taking over the growth of the cell, then promoting more growth is a, a viable option for it. Radiation's a big factor. Um, so radiation will damages DNA. It especially damages DNA that is in in chromosomes rather than chromatin. So radiation will damage cells that are in mitosis. Um, so radiation includes ultraviolet, so sunlight, x-rays, gamma rays, isotopes. Right? It's the reason why people that work in radiology have to wear dosimeter badges to, to look at how much dosage they're getting over a given time because it can lead to the promotion of tumor growth. A lot of times it's chemicals. So heavy metals, formaldehyde, solvents uh, are a big deal. Asbestos can be a big deal as well. Chronic irritation, inflammation, age, diet, and hormones are biological factors. So you bring all of these things together and you, and there are high risks, right? Avoidance of these things is probably a real good idea. So this is why people wear Tyvek suits when they're working with solvents. This is why we no longer use asbestos. This is why stopping cigarette smoking is a big deal. Uh, you know, that we took lead out of white paint uh, because heavy metals was a problem, uh, that we want to control inflammation and irritation and we want to watch our diet and uh, and be careful around genes and we wear lead aprons when we're getting dental x-rays and things like that because it's all about risk reduction. Uh, screening is a great idea, right? We want to really watch our biome. So probiotics is a big deal. Uh, getting enough fiber in the content is a big deal. Uh, reducing fat is rather controversial, but uh, one of the problems that they say about fat is it, it metabolizes to ketones, which then cause inflammation, et cetera. People with uh, with depressed immune systems are often at risk for cancer. So my son has had a kidney transplant. He takes immunosuppressive drugs. He is at risk for cancer higher than the, the average. So we have to do a lot of screening and we make sure of things. Uh, People that have AIDS, acquired immunodeficiencies, often die of Kerposi sarcomas. These are these are cancers. Um, people that are stressed, which suppresses immunity, are more at risk for for cancer. And the reason that immunosuppression happens is because it's cell-mediated immunity that recognizes the tumor cells and destroys them, uh, which is what we want. Suppress that and it's not going to work as well. Um, we like to like immunize people against 
especially the viral infections that uh, can that are going to cause cancer. The, the big ones are hepatitis and cervical cancer with HPV, um, that kind of thing. So what happens when you have cancer? Well, it depends on the cancer. It depends on the stage. It depends on nah, not so much on the grade. But uh, so really our options are cut it out, chemotherapy, enhance the immune system, or irradiate it. Um, often it's a combination of the above. So what we do is we shrink the tumor with uh, radiation, we surgically remove the remains, and then we systemically treat the body with chemotherapy and or immunotherapy. Uh, and try and hit it from a bunch of different fronts. Uh, so depending on where we, what grade and what stage the diagnosis is made, uh, we informs the treatment. Okay. So if it's early in the tumor growth, we even before signs and symptoms, uh, we can do early surgeries. We can we can uh, we can cure it just by cutting it out. Uh, if it's a little bit later, we might have to do radiation and chemotherapy. Now the target of radiation and chemotherapy is any cell that's in mitosis. Kind of get to that in a second. Uh, if it's late, we're probably relying more on radiation and chemo than we are the surgery. Uh, if it's gone so far, if it's resisting treatment, then it's palliative and just making people comfortable until they die. Again, these decisions are made on an individual basis based on the stage, the grade uh, of the diagnosis, the, the placement of it. Obviously, some things are not amenable to surgery because the damage that you're going to cause by getting at the tumor is going to be worse than, than the tumor. So surgery, could be with a laparoscopic, could be uh, it could be a complete like you can do a lumpectomy, you can do a mastectomy, uh, you know. So removal of adequate amount of amount of surrounding tissue. One of the problems with that is you remove too much of the tissue, and then there's the, we lose the function. Um, so radiofrequency ablation is uh, literally going in and blasting it. Uh, right? It's got to be, though, solid tumors in solid tissues. It doesn't work in tissues that have air, so like lung surgery. So what happens with radiation is that the energy of the radiation breaks up the chromosomes and the cells that are in mitosis die. And the idea here is that a lot of the tumor cells are in mitosis a lot of the time. And so it kind of targets that. But it also targets any healthy tissue that happens to be those cells that are undergoing mitosis as well. Um, Oftentimes we we do this radiation therapy to shrink the tumor so that there's less surgery. So it's kind of uh, therapy prior to surgery. It also kind of it can, is often used as a bit of a time management uh, thing. So we can schedule the surgery two weeks from now and, and get the resources available. Let's get you some radiation until such point. Often it's uh, cobalt, and so it's a specific burst, and 
uh, from an external machine that creates a beam of the radiation that's targeted at the tumor. Uh, as of 25 years ago, in insertion of radioactive, radioactive material into the tumor site uh, is become a normal thing. So now putting little radioactive seeds right into the tumor will kill the tumor and it acts because it acts a little more slowly, it's not as intense, it's, it's very effective. The reason I know it was 25 years ago is because my father was the very first person in Canada to have this done. They actually did a, a two-page uh, article on him and in uh, the Hamilton Spectator on the weekend edition, they, he had oncologists from all over Canada come in to witness this, what they did with them because it was brand new. Uh, so prostate cancer, now cervical cancer and, and things like that are often treated with that. Uh, sometimes they, they just put it into the body cavity. Uh, I don't know very much about that. I, I it's, so it's radioisotopes given by injection. The problem with with radiation is that any cells that are undergoing mitosis get damaged. And so your bone marrow is constantly undergoing that. And so you can end up with decreased blood cells, the formed elements leukocytes, erythrocytes, and platelets. So you, you can end up with anemia, you end up with increased risk of infection and, and, and clotting problems because of radiation. Epithelial cells are constantly undergoing, so, uh, so skin lesions can be problems. Walls of the blood vessels get damaged. Uh, hair follicles, will be killed and hair falls out, things like that. It causes, if it's anywhere near the gonads, it can cause infertility because it, um, because lots of meiosis uh, happening then. Because of this, it can lead to depression and lethargy, that kind of thing. Chemotherapy uh, is, is a uh, very common thing. All the drugs, the class is anti-neoplastic. Usually it's not used alone, it's usually used in combination. Uh, it's a cocktail of drugs that they develop for whatever's going on. Uh, it's given a periodic intervals uh, and it interferes with DNA replication uh, again in cells that are at that point and and so these are cells that are undergoing my mitosis and therefore are cells that are likely tumor cells but it's also skin cells and bone marrow and all of that same stuff that we just talked about it targets the same sorts of cells um and so that's a, a very real problem one of the good things about chemotherapy though is that it's systemic it goes everywhere in your body and so is a useful way of dealing with metastasis even if the metastasis hasn't been uh identified yet. So if, if somebody's at stage three, maybe we've just missed the metastasis for stage four. So let's do chemotherapy prophylactically. So this shows where the different chemotherapies uh, attack in, during the cell life cycle. But bone marrow depression, nausea, because the the um, lining of the digestive system is 
really uh, affected. Epithelial cell, uh, lung problems, sometimes kidney damage, trying to get rid of it. So other things like hormones. So it's say like in the case of prostate cancer, they often give these men estrogen because what that does is it blocks the testosterone from affecting the uh, the the uh, prostate and will therefore slow down the growth of the tumor. There's various blocking agents, uh, angiogenesis inhibitors. We talked about angiogenesis being an important contributor to the growth. So that is a big deal. Analgesics is all about palliative and about keeping people comfortable. All kinds of new drugs emerging. Uh, I mean, this is a, a big deal. Gene therapy is looking at trying to uh, introduce new genetic material so that so that the pro pro uh, carcinogens have got nothing to hold on to. Nutrition is uh, a big deal, uh, you know. All kinds of complementary therapies, massage, meditation, uh, things like that are really important. And these are kind of the holistic events. So when you get your cancer diagnosis, most people really worry about prognosis. And when we say prognosis, as far as statistics are concerned, we call, we talk about a five-year survival rate without reoccurrence. Um, the, one of the problems with five-year survival rate is that it's often skewed by other things. Like, so in the case of prostate cancer, where you know half the people that have diagnosed with prostate cancer are already in their seventies or their 80s, what's their five-year survival rate anyways? Uh, so, but we look at, at this. Generally speaking, things that are caught early tend to have better prognosis than things that are caught late. And the things that are caught early are the things that actually give you more symptoms. Well, one of the problems, there's a very low five-year survival rate for pancreatic cancer. And that's because pancreatic cancer doesn't give a lot of symptoms and people don't know they have it until they're already very far along. They're in, in high stages, right? Um, so we look at some cancers. We say that people are cancer-free. Usually we talk about remission, though. Uh, so remission is where everything seems to back off, but it can come back. Um, Life expectancy, death rates really vary for the different types of cancers. Like I say, the, the death rate of, um, of um, pancreatic cancer is quite high. The death rate of skin cancer is quite low. A lot to do with diagnosis, a lot to do with screening, a lot to do with the properties of the tumor itself and the symptoms that it creates. Skin cancer is easily diagnosed, easily treated, excellent prognosis. Malignant melanomas that are left untreated can be uh, can have a poorer prognosis. They're very often diagnosed. They're not the most diagnosed type of cancer, but it's it's high. Uh, Ovarian cancer has a poor prognosis because, and high mortality rates because, quite frankly, they come on at a time of like perimenopausally, and and there are a, a lot of the symptoms can be just attributed to aging and normal um, or common menopause type things. Uh, brain tumors are quite dangerous because of 
the space they take up they don't have to be metastasized uh they uh it's about the space now neuromas are fairly rare because neurons don't undergo mitosis so uh oftentimes it's the connective tissue or the glial cells that are uh, that are most affected in these brain tumors so like here's a picture of a basal cell carcinoma uh it's got a very distinctive pattern that kind of erosion in the center prognosis for this is excellent brain tumors prognosis not so good because of the size and the inaccessibility to uh, to treat a good friend of mine died last Wednesday of a brain tumor. It was diagnosed about three years ago, and uh, she passed away just very recently. Cancer affects 50% of people in North America. Like, it's a very, very common thing. Men specifically, I know it's it's fifty percent. Women, it's maybe a little bit higher, uh, but it's it's around that that mark. It, so about half of all people will have a cancer diagnosis at some point. Uh, the most common cancer in uh, in men is prostate cancer, with lung cancer and colorectal cancer coming in third and fourth and there's some question whether skin cancer is outnumbering colorectal so it, it, it's kind of right in there uh prostate is the most common though virtually all men past a certain age past the age of 80 have some thing of prostate cancer um it's also interesting that it's usually so slow progressing that more men die with prostate cancer than from prostate cancer. But it metastasizes the bone, can be quite uncomfortable and, uh, and quite a problem. Um, most common cancer in women is breast cancer, followed by lung cancer, and colorectal cancer. Breast cancer gets a lot of breast cancer awareness and people are quite concerned about it. People, there's lots of screening, mammograms and self-examination. Because of that, uh, breast cancer is the most common diagnosis uh, because it's picked up. Uh, the it can be very aggressive. It it takes people. The five year survival rate is kind of mid range. The earlier it's caught, the better the prognosis. Uh, there are a lot of treatment options uh, for it. Not all of them work. Can lung and colorectal, second and third skin cancers right up there too. So kind of like. The big four, the big three for everybody are lung, colorectal, and skin, uh, with prostate edging out those three in men and breast edging out those three in women. Uh, breast cancer, most common diagnosis that there is. Okay, so uh, that'll conclude what we're looking at for neoplasia.